we're doomed. Or are we? I don't know. Like, Chris will tell us. So um, I, I, I see that his talk is for sure, like, inspirational. Um, and yeah, I like, hope you will enjoy it. And again, do ask questions. I see a constant influx of questions. That's very good, very good. Yeah, we are getting there. Uh, and rate, 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 rate. So Orange Tessie bot, again, like it's available everywhere. I will stop repeating this probably after the next one. But yeah, like uh, uh, I need to motivate uh, all of you because speakers would really appreciate ratings. They, they really live for it. So um, rate them and Chris, uh, fire it up. Okay. Thanks for having me. This is my third time at Vox Belgrade. My fourth time in Belgrade. It's one of my favorite cities in Europe. So it's great to be back. And pretty much every time I've done a talk about a completely different subject. <laughs> so at this time, I've decided to be that uh, stupid person who comes to a tech event and doesn't talk really about technology, but talks about things around technology. So. What exactly is this talk about? I've gone for the clickbait title, and there's some reasons for that, because actually I spend half my time working as a tech journalist. So of course I'm used to writing clickbait titles. But as part of that, I go to a lot of startup events, and lots of events where uh, people in technology are pitching ideas at me, and I hear a lot of terrible ideas, a lot of good ideas, but also a lot of ideas that sometimes you think, why are you making this? And I don't mean that in terms of it's a crazy idea. I mean in terms of, is this a good idea for the world? <laughs> so, and this is kind of what this talk is about. It's a little bit about stepping back and thinking about what we do. But let's first go way back. So technology and humans using technology to enhance our lives is nothing new at all. From the various, very earliest days, of humanity, we have been using technology and tools to aid ourselves and better ourselves. These, of course, are stone tools. I don't exactly know how old they are or where they're from, but some of these will be familiar with things we still use now. Let's jump forward a bit. This is obviously a modern picture, but of something that has been going for a very long time. Beasts of burden, using animals not really a technology in themselves, but the way that we harness them and attach them to farming machinery was a massive, massive breakthrough. And actually, this is something else I would also encourage, especially technology people in this time to reflect on, is we often think that what we're doing now is the first massive breakthrough there's ever been. And it, there's many times where we said the same thing. And this basically enabled humans to stop working in fields so much and focus on other things, creating more technology. Jumping forward again, the printing press is another classic example. The printing press was the internet of its time. Before the printing press, literacy was to the privileged few. Very few people could read or write and were subjugated and oppressed by rulers because of that. The printing press made the word cheap and meant that people could learn to read and write and there was a massive, massive technological change. But now let's jump forward quite a few centuries. <laughs> um, and I guess one of the recurring themes with a lot of these as well, and this is especially happening with technology now, is that often there is some short-term pain for some long-term gain. And yeah, I'm going to go through a couple of examples from the last, pretty much the last 10 years now, where the pace of change is really rapid now. I'm not going to be naive enough to say that we're being as innovative as we ever have, but we're certainly being innovative much quicker than we ever have for various reasons. So one classic one would be the smartphone. 10 years old now. It seems like it's been with us forever, but it really hasn't. 10 years old. Many would say, this has had a positive effect on society in ways of connectivity. It's actually also empowered people in the developing world. It's devoured, devoured? Oh dear. <laughs> empowered, empowered uh, women in the developing world to have access to information and resources they never had access to in the past. So there's a lot of positives with the mobile phone. Social networks, again, 
They have enabled us to connect to people, family and friends all over the world that we were never able to before. We can now connect with people who we lost touch with, who are hard to find very easily now. Lots of positives in human interaction. Automated cars are, well, they're actually already here. We're just sort of waiting for a lot of legal reasons and infrastructure reasons to really make them rolled out fully. And when these are here fully, they will also bring a lot of positives. They will bring probably less accidents. Um, there's always this aspect of more time to spend on more creative pursuits, um, a lot less anger and stress on the road, and also potentially the ability to remove a lot of vehicles from the road that are doing nothing and causing a lot of pollution. So there will be a lot of positives from automated cars. And then finally, I've used this as a positive of a demonstration. This is HealthKit from Apple, but I want to use it as a demonstration of a positive of big data. Big data is behind a lot of modern technologies, and this ability to uh, record, store, and process massive amounts of data effectively has had some real positives. Now, one of the big positives with HealthKit is it's enabled scientists, medical scientists, and professionals to do research at a scale and speed that was never possible before. Previously, often, medical um, research happened very slowly and with actually a very small amount of people, and this caused problems. Now, within weeks, uh, doctors can do research with tens of thousands of people, uh, mostly only in a couple of countries, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, just by the way, there's some seats at the front if anyone wants to come here. I don't mind. Okay, so that's a um, look at some of the really big developments in technology of the past 10 years and some of the positive aspects. But is anyone familiar with this character from history? Yeah? So, just in case you're not, I don't want to assume you are, this is Frankenstein. Or to be precise, Frankenstein's monster. This is often a mistake that is made. The story is an old story. Uh, Dr. F Victor Frankenstein aims to prove his experiments in reanimating dead creatures with a potentially positive impact of bringing back the dead. I'm sure there's positives to that, but anyway, <laughs> that was his thinking. Um, but throughout the book, the monster turns on its creator and Victor regrets his creation and the power it has over him. And in the English language, at least, the phrase Frankenstein's monster has often come to mean a creation that you sort of regret and haunts you and is hard to shake. And it's used quite a lot to describe this phrase. And I think this story is also a nice analogy that as engineers especially, we have a tendency to keep making things because we want to and keep making things because we want to find out what's possible and not necessarily because we actually really need them or anyone else needs them. And also as engineers, we tend to sometimes be somewhat idealistic about what a cool piece of technology is without thinking about how other people might interpret it or use it for good or evil. And this is kind of the lesson of some very famous engineers. Here is one, Albert Einstein, uh, is possibly one of the more famous examples of who really regretted his discovery of nuclear fission and what it led to. And in his mind, it was a very positive potential for energy, and it led to some great negatives in the world. And it was one of his biggest regrets in some respects. Another one, I mean, <laughs> if you invent a gun, I don't know why you'd ever think it wouldn't be used for negative, but, <laughs> but strangely, Mikhail Kalashnikov, famously posing here with the AK-47, he actually kind of intended it to be used for good. And with the AK-47 is now one of the most widespread guns used by a wide variety of people on all sides of, I mean, one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist, etc., etc. But again, he regretted his invention. And just because we're getting quite serious here, I want to throw in a slightly more lighthearted example. I don't know if you're familiar now with these uh, coffee pods, coffee capsules everywhere. 
So actually, John Sylvan invented these, and he really regrets his invention because of the uh, rubbish it causes. <laughs> so he's actually, and there's also many examples, like the inventor of the Segway and many others who have sort of made an idea that they thought was amazing and sort of regretted it in the long run. But let's, what even about some of the recent examples we looked at? This is an article from a couple of weeks ago, and there's a link here you can read it. Um, this is actually some of the creators behind the algorithms of Facebook, Google, Twitter, coming out very publicly recently to say that they really regret what they worked on now. So this is some recent examples too. Um, and I don't know if anyone has read or seen, and I hope you haven't seen it, because the film is really not very good, of The Circle by David Eggers. Uh, and it's a similar thing in there, that often trying to escape the kind of the walled garden of a community that you now regret is hard as well. Um, and especially in these very connected times, even if you disagree, trying to sort of get out of it is, is hard as well. So this is very recent examples of uh, the creators of some of these algorithms regretting them and turning away from them and encouraging people to, to, uh, to question what they use. So, let's take another look back at some of the positive technologies from the past 10 years with a new angle. So firstly, the smartphone. We talked about how smartphones have created tremendous opportunities for connection and communication. Um, but of course, and this is becoming increasingly talked about, there's a lot of evidence to show they have some harmful effects too. Uh, isolation, increased isolation in kind of face-to-face -face communication. There's FOMO, fear of missing out. I personally suffer from this on a massive scale. The fact now that I can know that there's 20 things every night I want to go to means I want to go to all of them. And that's actually, it sounds like one of these sort of first world problems, but it's actually mentally quite stressful over time. And we're sort of putting ourselves into these situations because we know about so much. This also increases loneliness. All my, um, all my friends are here, which is a positive in some respects, but it's also a negative because they're not here in front of me instead. Um, and one of the reasons actually that cited in this article is about there's actually a, like a high that's similar to drugs that you get from these connections that makes you feel like it's good, but it's actually having a negative effect on you. So it's, it's only, you know, the smartphone was invented 10 years ago. So of course, research into the negative effects is all very recent. Um, there's also massive effects on sleep. We all are looking at far too many screens before we go to bed. Stress, concentration. Again, this is one I suffer from. I find it very hard now to focus on single tasks. Procrastination, which seems like a contradiction, but uh, you know, it's very easy now to keep switching to other things instead of focusing. And then more pragmatically for us in this room, smartphones have re significantly reduced the prices people are willing to pay for things. We were all told about this great dream of being independent developers selling apps, but who can sell an app for more than $5 these days? It's very hard. So it also changed things more pragmatically. Social networks. I'm sure you're familiar with this face. Um, and again, social networks as kind of geeky, nerdy, isolated, probably in our schools, children. Social networks brought a lot of positives to us because we found people like us in the world and felt a lot better for it. But some would start saying, now, have they gone too far? There's a lot of similar negatives with the smartphone here, but with a few extra thrown in for good measure. Bullying, trolling. It's becoming... A, the trolling sort of epidemic this year alone has been insane. I, I don't know how much you follow it, but some of the stuff you read about happening especially to certain minorities, is crazy. And it's because it's so easy to do it now. Then we have issues like filter bubbles, data harvesting. I now live in Germany. Germany is somewhat obsessed with data privacy. But sometimes, you know, at extremes, if the US and Germany are at two extremes, somewhere in the middle sometimes is a sort of a place to maybe be thinking. Privacy, addiction, depression, jealousy, fear of missing out again. And this may all seem 
kind of why worry about it so much, but we have seen in the past year that these have led to real world problems with increasing polarization of people. It's very hard to now express opinions, uh, populism, extreme views that's happening everywhere, and a lot of it is to do with these increasing kind of tribes being isolated from each other. Um, automated cars. Um, I'm actually not gonna, I'm gonna focus on some of the other aspects that automated cars will have in a minute, but one of the ones I wanna focus on here is responsibility. So this is a crashed Tesla, one of the few, to be fair, but there's not that many on the road. Um, but cars are actually the biggest killer worldwide second to disease. So cars with humans driving have killed a lot of people. And the very worrying question to ask for us as programmers or involved in technology is if a programmed car kills someone, who's responsible? And this is a question that's coming up quite a lot. And it's one of the reasons why you find very few open source projects because there's no company behind it to accept responsibility from an open source car. Um, and some will say that removing more humans from the equation solves this problem, but we're hard to know yet. And I sort of, I sort of have this worry, you know, these are sort of poor teams of developers. If Tesla or a company gets sued, they want someone to blame. And you can bet it will be the people like us who are not very good at defending ourselves. <laughs> so we'll wait to see about that. But it's something to be concerned about. The more things are automated, the more, more responsibility will be on the code as well. And then finally, in big data, this is actually, uh, I was at a conference in Ukraine a couple of weeks ago, and this is the CEO of Cambridge Analytica, the company behind the Trump campaign, the Brexit campaign, and it was an amazing talk. I hope it's, I think it's online. The conference was called IT Arena. And firstly, because he was such a nice guy, <laughs> and secondly, his talk was so casual. But the stuff that he was saying was just mind-blowing. And for example, this, is, well, you can see the title, but he's talking about how effectively the uh, uh, Trump campaign underspent the Clinton campaign in terms of marketing because it was so targeted, they knew exactly where not to not even waste their time and money. Um, and some of the things that this company in particular can now do, like targeting advertising at you, not only that, targeting the content of the advertising at you dynamically as well from this company. Uh, an incredibly fascinating company in every way. <laughs> so, um, and this is kind of the negative sides of big data, feeding into a lot of those other aspects that we talked about earlier. Now, I don't want to get into dark territory here about saying when we're working with clients, especially in sort of third party uh, agencies, we're just following orders. Well, as I kind of come back to in the Tesla example. Firstly, this may or may not be a defense in the future, but secondly, I would like to think that, especially as people here at a conference who like to come and meet people and learn things, you take a little bit of personal responsibility and ethics too. So if you're asked to work on a project that you feel uncomfortable about, say no. There's plenty of work out there. If you don't feel comfortable with working on a weapons system, it's an extreme example, but say no. You don't have to do everything you're told. Okay. Before moving any further, let's of course take about the obvious example of, uh, and I'm going to focus now a little bit on artificial intelligence and machine learning and things like that, because I guess with a lot of the earlier technologies, we were still somewhat in control. But now, and actually there's been a lot of talks at this conference around these subjects, we're now starting to create machines that can create machines. And this is where it starts to get a bit messier because we're starting to lose control a little bit. So this is sort of where I want to take this focus of this now. So one of the obvious things we start to talk about is job losses, of course. Uh, and this one thing we have to bear in mind here is not just in direct industries. So for example, with the self-driving car, we're not just necessarily taking away jobs of drivers, we're also taking away jobs of hundreds of thousands of companies that serve drivers. Cafes, restaurants, petrol stations, uh, um, auto part manufacturers, like it's a huge industry. I'm not a fan of cars, but it is a huge industry. And again, as I referred to earlier, history does show 
that most major technology changes resulted in short-term losses that eventually recover. But again, we're kind of facing things at a scale and speed that we've never seen before. And this can have a big effect on society, and we're not really sure what it's going to be. And actually, despite this talk, this is really a talk about making you think. I am an optimist, and I think we will work it out, but I just want to think about it. <laughs> and this is not to say it's just kind of workers in factories, car drivers, and things like that. These are white-collar jobs that are already being replaced by automation. Um, financial and sports reporters, because it's mostly reporting statistics. Online marketing. Some people would say you're not too sad that some of these jobs are going, but anyway, there's people behind them. Medical profession. Some of these areas are going already. And actually, the medical profession is one area where AI could really have a positive impact as well. Um, E-discovery lawyers. So this is basically research lawyers, not the people who are up in court, but the people doing the research for those people. And then financial analysis and advisors. There's now vast majorities of stock markets in the world are automated. And in, it's actually crazy if you look into the numbers, the amount of money that financial trading now spends on internet backbone. They have some of the fastest internet connections in the world because shaving off even a few hundred milliseconds can make millions. So, so one of the other defences here is we've always thought, well, as creative people, we'll be okay. The machines are good at the repetitive stuff. We're creative people. We'll be all right. Let's have a look. There's this website that. Uh, came out a couple of months ago about uh, will a robot take my job or something like that. I can't remember the exact title. So here's a few examples: computer programmers, 48% start worrying. I mean, take this with a, a grain of salt, as we say, but start worrying. I don't know what exactly that means, but so you're、yeah, sort of okay. Let's have a look at me. This is my job. That's not so good. <laughs> it's, it's, that's not so good for me.、Um, to be fair. This is talking about things like API documentation and things like that, which is already quite well automated. You know, if you're writing tutorials and things like that, it's a bit different. So, on the more creative side of the work I do, 3.8 percent. I don't know. Actually, there's a lot of novels that have been written by machines, and they sell. <laughs> so,、um, yeah. <laughs> But this is again to be taken with a pinch of salt. Here, I don't think you can really read this. But here's actually an example of an article on wearable tech written by AI writer.、Uh, I can read some of it.、Um, okay, so this third paragraph from the bottom: increased reality and wearing technology can combine into a more realistic and engaging real-time environment. Okay, as a native English speaker, it's not great, but it's actually good enough. <laughs> so it's, and especially at the speed and attention that people now read online. It's probably fine, which is sort of worrying in itself. As a positive for the organisers of this event, 3.7 percent. I think herding cats into conference venues is still going to be quite hard for robots to do for a while yet. So, so if all else fails, become a conference organiser.、Uh, well, we'll have nothing else to do, so we might as well go to conferences. So,、um, if you're interested in reading a bit more on. Some of these subjects, the Wikipedia page, and kind of a historical record of what is termed technological unemployment, is a really interesting article. And then, I guess, so the second link is about what will life be like. And this is one of those interesting ones where there's been a lot of arguments around saying we'll have more time to solve life's bigger problems,、uh, problems we haven't had the time to solve right now. If machines are doing a lot of the menial work. We could focus on the big things, and this is a really nice dream. And I hope this dream isn't just a dream, with concepts like universal basic income and aspects like that. But I mean, it's not going to happen in our lifetime. It may happen in our children's generation or our grandchildren's generation, but it's going to take a huge global shift to change this. And the interesting fact here is it has to be global because if Western Europe has universal basic income, but Asia doesn't, then it doesn't really work because people will just go to Asia for cheaper work. So it really has to be universal. It's almost like you remember in Star Trek: The Next Generation where they talk about we just solved conflict. They're like, 
how, but anyway, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's very nice to sort of think we could do this, and I really hope we can, but it's, let's be realistic, it's not going to be in our lifetimes, but let's, let's hope. Okay. So, possibly one of the uh, bigger issues to think about is algorithms themselves. So, algorithms are unbiased, but humans, we are biased, whether we like it or not. Consciously or subconsciously, we do have biases. And this is more, probably more of a concern, again, at the moment, because uh, we have a lot of control still. We know when we've made a mistake and we can correct it. But if machines that we have programmed are programming other machines with those biases, then it becomes a bit more problematic. And I mean, a lot in the tech world has been spoken about the dominance of particular demographics of people in technology, and this has impacts in many ways. And one of the big impacts is this, this sort of uh, biasing of algorithms without us realizing. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples, and these are all real examples. Some are famous, some are not so famous. Here is one. Um, this is uh, from Facebook, I think uploading a passport, and uh, it's a gentleman of Asian origin of some of a country, I'm not 100% sure, but the text says the photo you want to upload does not meet our criteria because your eyes are closed. It's a classic example of an artificial intelligence programmed mostly by probably Western white people, not quite thinking about different people in the world. And the comments are kind of, at the moment we still laugh about a lot of this stuff, but, you know, we should really be doing better by now. <laughs> so, um, and here's another example. Um, this is, yeah, well, you could, you kind of get the idea. Yeah. Uh, it's not great. <laughs> um, and another one in a similar vein. You might have seen this video. I hope it plays the soap dispenser. Yeah. And why you would even program a soap dispenser to detect color instead of just presence, I don't know, but <laughs> it's, yeah. And again, this was even the, they're laughing, you can't hear the audio, but they're laughing about it. Like, it's funny, but it's really not funny as well. If you take this at a wider, if this was a robot instead, then we start to get a bit more concerned. There's also examples recently um, about uh, an AI that was created, I think, it's still a bit uncertain, by people who were hoping to highlight potential issues, but an AI that could identify uh, gay people from photos. And even if that, this comes back to that whole aspect of don't engineer things just because you can. Because think about that. Okay, even if you're trying to prove a point, great. But in the wrong hands, that is a potentially deadly technology. So sometimes, you know, think about the things. And here's an example from the past couple of days. This was now held a record for the quickest um, feature pull down in history. <laughs> uh, in the US on Google Maps, it was showing you how many calories you would burn. That's not too bad. There's many apps that do that, but they're kind of apps you've opted into. But how many cupcakes you could have eaten. And this instantly sparked problems with mental health, uh, food disorder organizations, and all sorts of things. And this was pulled down within hours. So uh, it happens to all of everybody. And this is a very recent example. So again, I reiterate, this is why we should worry about this stuff now. Because at the moment, we can laugh a bit about it, and us humans can pull it down. But this is already happening. AIs are writing AIs. And if they have our biases, then there could be some problems. <laughs> so. Let's start sort of thinking about these things now. So I'm not a Luddite or anti-technology, not at all. In fact, I love technology. I'm very pro-change. But I'm mostly pro-improving our lives through technology. So I'm not saying that you should stop creating, not at all. Keep creating. But I want you to ask more questions as you are creating. And two of these questions are kind of the, the broad ones. Just because you can, should you? This applies 
even at smaller levels as well. We all know the jokes about JavaScript frameworks and how many there are, because we create them because we can. Why? Why didn't we help someone else improve their one instead? And we could see it with more potentially harmful or society-changing applications as well. Just because we can code it, do we need to? Do we need to show off how good we are on this application, or is there a better way to do it? So think of the consequences first, even the unintended consequences. Think, I think there's a famous quote from someone, I'm not entirely sure, I might have even heard it on TV and made it up, about think about the worst that could happen. Like, go crazy. Think about the worst that could happen and work back from there. And yeah, I, I'm being serious in that, even the smallest thing you make. Think about the worst that could happen. I've worked in open source software for a, quite a long time. And as an open source person, you tend to think your software is always used by kind of left-leaning, well-meaning organizations. Of course it's not. Open source software is used by everybody, people whose opinions you won't agree with. <laughs> so, and I've met some of them using the software I worked on, and it surprised me. So points to remember. Let's enhance humans, but not replace them. This is kind of starting to bubble up now throughout the AI community this aspect and thought of let's enhance who we are, not replace us. And this has been a good indication of good technologies throughout history as well. Let's remember the users. This is a broad thing as well. It's not just related to what we've been talking about, but to be blunt, if you remember your users, you'll also sell more. So let's bring in those user design people Let's bring in some ethics people. Let's think a little bit about who is going to be using what we have. Again, involve people from different backgrounds. I don't just mean gender and race. I mean different backgrounds ethically, different backgrounds historically, different um, educations, different cultures. And it's actually quite interesting. I was speaking with uh, someone earlier about in certain countries, it's quite hard to find people from different backgrounds. So how do you speak to those people? And this is actually an interesting challenge that I hadn't thought about because I've always lived in very diverse countries where I can find people from a hundred different backgrounds within about 10 minutes. But how do you do this in, in countries where it's harder to find those people? It's actually a hard one. I don't really have an answer to this question right now. But again, we have the internet. They're out there somewhere. We can find them if we want to. And then, I guess finally, more pragmatically for you, maybe being automated, 48% chance, keep learning and stay up to date. Always keep learning. It's good for you anyway. It's what makes us human. And if you are replaced by a machine, we'll hopefully have other skills you can use somewhere else. So kind of ending on a positive. This is my chinchilla, by the way. Uh, maybe you're wondering why this random picture just appeared. The future is up to you, up to us. So. Let's try to be awesome with it and not do bad. So thank you very much. Um, this is how you can get in touch with me. I think, I hope there's a lot of questions we can talk about here and afterwards. Uh, also more stupidly, if you like the chinchilla, I have stickers. <laughs> but thank you very much and I hope there's some questions. Or thoughts, statements, if you like. Yeah, yeah. I I don't see any on the bot, but maybe we have some live questions. Oh my God! So far, <laughs> technology is there to help us. You know, I don't need to run and stuff. So hi, I'm Ognin. So basically, I hear a lot from the these talks and generally talks about artificial intelligence. It's usually us and them. So it's the evil robots and us. Could you just share your thoughts about the approach where we maybe go into the direction where we actually migrate with or merge with yeah. artificial intelligence? So the, question what the question was uh, about countering us versus them, whereas with us with them instead. No. Yeah, what would be and okay? actually, yeah, this is kind of, I guess, one of my main points is try to make uh, technology, digital or physical, that helps us and enhances us. I think one of the best current examples of this is with aged care. Often, older people actually just want someone to talk to. 
And us younger people were all too busy. Um, and there's been a lot of robots in aged care institutions where they just listen to the person. And this is a, an awesome, amazing example. They just wanted something that feels like it's listening, and it does. And that's actually a, an amazing example. So I think, I think, I say I'm an optimist, really, and I think what you say, us with them, is hopefully and probably the actual reality that will happen. So it's You mentioned the idea of making sure that your workplace and your um, you know, what you're doing is ethical. The idea of ethics in um, in AI and in your work as a developer. How do you know from the get-go that a workplace is ethical? How do you make that decision? They you know they all promote free beer and football, but what about the rest? Yeah. <laughs> so it's about how do you know a workplace is ethical? I think well. Firstly, I guess everyone's uh, measure of what is acceptable or ethical is different. Um, I guess the main most practical thing I could say as people in tech, we are tremendously privileged. Even in poorer countries, we are actually very privileged. We can really take our pick of jobs. So I guess my, my statement would be, you go to a lot of companies and they promise you things like good wages, free drinks, uh, fun, entertainment, I mean, let's be blunt, they're all offering that now. So base your decisions on other things. Do you like the previous work they've done? Do you like the way they think about work? Do you like what they make? I guess that's really the only practical thing I could say, is make your decisions about where you work on other factors, because to be blunt, we're all privileged, and we're all getting more than we need anyway, so you ha we have the luxury to make our decisions based on other important factors. So. You said the necessary changes like universal income and these kind of things are not necessarily happening in our lifetime, uh, but in our children's lifetime. So, uh, my well, first of all, a point, the thing in Star Trek was basically because there was a nuclear war before they actually found the thing. So much of a trick, we are closer <laughs> to that than to the other thing. Uh, but the, uh, the main question is like, what can we make happen right now? And I'm, I'm, I'm now talking about my talk later where I'm going to talk about this as well. I think we cannot just wait for it. We have to do something ourselves to make sure for our children, I don't have any, but other people's children, to uh, get to this space. What can we do right now to make this happen? Is it more awareness about what is already happening to these things, or is it just making sure that we're actually part of this movement rather than just somebody rich doing it for us? So the question was about what can we do about it for us and our children. Um, well, firstly, I would say uh, Christian plugged his, his own talk, which is where you could find some things, which is probably one good immediate starting point. But the second one would, of course, be a lot of the things I spoke about. Question what you do yourself. But when it comes especially to the younger generation, I would say, like, we're now teaching children in schools in a lot of places how to code, and this is great. But one of the things I think we're lacking in education is some of the other aspects, like especially around data privacy and security and things like that. Um, like when I was at school, our computer science classes revolved around using Microsoft Office, which was also not up to par at the time. And now I think if they're not being taught in school about how algorithms work and how data is collected, then we should be teaching our children that. And I'm not saying it's wrong or right. Make your own decisions. But when you have the knowledge and you have the education, then you can make those decisions. So I actually think that's one of the biggest aspects to teach young people right now is how these companies make money and then they can make their own decisions, actually. Yeah. Well, as, is it on? Is it on? Okay, I'm on. Um, one thing that um, I didn't hear you mention, but it has to do with our dependence on technology increasing, yet, uh, when technology breaks down, uh, the consequences are much greater than when we didn't use the technology, right? And um, is that another aspect that I should be taking into account? In other words, what happens if this technology either fails or yep. doesn't work, yep. um, and how do I deal with that? Yep. Actually, one of the best examples of this is a kind of a dumb one, but sometimes a simple example is the easiest ones to illustrate it. So there was an, an Internet of Things connected pet feeder that... Uh, when the internet broke, it didn't work anymore, and pets were left without food for days. And it's a really dumb example, 
And, but it's a good example to show how simple it can be to, for a problem like that, when we've in, become so dependent. So I guess, as technologists, we should always make sure that there's a plan B, when there's no connection or whatever it may be. Don't be reliant on one service always being there and have a, a backup plan for how it works without that connection. And then I guess as consumers, we have to demand that equally. When there's three products to choose from, we pick the ones that are more decentralized and available to work more independently and things like that, I guess. Um, but in the broader scheme of things, so I am personally quite worried about what will happen with automated cars if similar things happen. What happens? Do cars everywhere suddenly start stopping on the road? I no idea. And this is probably a bigger case of what I'd be interested actually to find out what companies like Tesla are doing. Like what if there is no connection anymore? What happens? Uh, how long can it go without phoning home and et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Um, and this will become an increasing problem. We, we think there's internet everywhere. There really isn't. So, <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. I see a big zero. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.